From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman, and welcome to this special Cube presentation. We're talking with Pensando, and uh, their event is Future Proof Your Enterprise to help us really understand uh, where the company is and the partnerships, what they're hearing from customers. Really happy to welcome back to our program, Randy Pond. He is the Chief Financial Officer at Pensando. Randy, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, thanks for having me. All right, well, well Randy, uh, you know, obviously today, you know, we're, we're talking to people everywhere, they're remote, so not quite as plush as the last time we talked to you uh, <laughs> at the Goldman Sachs office in New York City. Beautiful view in the background, uh, but uh, you know, that was a great backdrop. When you talk about bringing a company out of stealth, uh, you know, John Chambers, you know, there, you know, cha your chairman, uh, Antonio Neri, Neri uh, yeah. t talking about the investment and the partnership, uh, and, you know, Goldman Sachs, you know, an excellent uh, customer there. Here we are, you know, a little bit more than six months uh, later, uh, and, you know, that partnership with HPE is taking the next step. Uh, you've got the general availability this month of, of the uh, HPE ProLiant with Pensando Solutions. Um, bring us up to speed a little bit, though. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about HP maybe in a second, but you know your customers, your progress. Uh, you know you had, uh, I believe it was up to your C round of funding uh, when you came out of stealth. So uh, give give us your your viewpoint as to where the company is today. So today, I think we're sort of I'm divided conversation between financial and from a business perspective. So financially, we're in great shape. The C round came together very well. We were way oversubscribed. We we raised our limits to secure additional funding, which has worked out really well given where we are currently with the pandemic. So financially, we're in great shape. Um, our cash burn is held, is held steady, and we've done a good job of forecasting that, so I think the board's pleased. From a, from a business perspective, um, we've done a really good job um, deli delivering on our roadmap from a product perspective. So the team has released uh, the uh, cloud um, production. We had a release to the cloud customers about a month or two ago. We just did a release to the enterprise space through HPE. We got another release coming up at the end of this month. Um, there's releases scheduled for Q3 and Q4 this year. Um, our second ASIC um, will come out of, will come back, uh, I think the 15th of June. So we're going to get access to our new design. Um, I think that's great news. Some of our cloud customers are excited about that because it provides a little more capability than the, the current device does. So, and we had a great Q1 and we're off to a great start on Q2. We overachieved in Q1. We look like we're going to overachieve again in Q2, both in terms of units and dollars. So we're in a good, pretty, pretty good place. Yeah, uh, I, I like, we can break down to kind of the financial and the business piece. On, on the financial f f side piece, uh, you've worked with this team for uh, quite a long time. Uh, there's got to be, a, you know, a different financial model that you put in place um, when you know that you've got really your exit built in, as you had from the three spin-ins before. Um, it proved the, yeah. proved the product, get it out there, and then, well, you know, I've got an in-house team uh, with a full channel there as opposed to today. Is the model we should be thinking, you know, what percentage of that is OEM? Uh, you talk about there's the cloud model and the enterprise model. Um, and, you know, how do you structure things a little bit differently uh, for that time of model versus maybe what the spin-ins were or, you know, a traditional startup that sure. uh, might have a different, few different models to choose from? So we're much closer aligned to a traditional startup environment. Now, the one unique point is the HPE relationship because They've been my primary, they are my primary go-to-market partner in the enterprise space today, but they're also a strategic investor. So the reality is in the enterprise space, we have to sell the product through the OEMs. They, most, the average enterprise customer doesn't have the capacity to install it himself. Well, that's a very different model than it is on the cloud side. So it's an indirect sales model, most likely through HPE and other server providers like Dell, um, Cisco possibly, um, Supermicro. Um, every customer has their sort of requested server manufacturer. On the cloud side, the, that individuals build their own. So that's a, I ship to them and they install it themselves. It's a different software model, it's a different manufacturing model. Um, and then we have a more traditional direct sales model on that side, where we've got a partner enablement model on the enterprise side today. We've set them up as both. HPE sort of serves like a quasi Cisco environment for us because we're depending on their engine to find our leads and it's worked out really, really well. Excellent. Uh, maybe you know, bring us inside a little bit where you are with you know what you say about customer acquisition leading up to now, and you know what's the expectation uh, now that HPE is you know fully ready to roll. So um, we let me split the conversation again. There's the cloud side. So on the cloud side, we have 
three committed customers today. Um, one is in production. Um, the other two are going into production later part of this year. They need the release we're going to give them in September, October timeframe, but they've committed to us from a design perspective. And then there's a follow-on generation of product in 21 where they really ramp hard. Um, I already have a signed contract with two while I'm working on the third. Um, on the enterprise side, we're, we're modeling ourselves after the top 200 HPE customers right now. So they normally align themselves around financial services, pharmaceuticals, transportation, SLED. Um, we're working through those customers. We have active POPs in many of them today. They're in our sales pipeline. We manage that relationship together. Generally, HPE opens the door. We explain the technology to the um, technical team. Um, they say they can see a place for us, and they let us stand up a, a POC, and then we go from there. Excellent. Uh, so, Randy, you know, we reference uh, the, the global pandemic going on right now. It's been uh, a bit of a bifurcated model in the tech world. Uh, you know, it's been definitely a tailwind, somewhat from, from the cloud standpoint. Uh, there's many infrastructure pieces uh, that have seen us, uh, you know, an immediate acceleration, things like work from home technology. Um, so, you know, there, there's certain devices and certain deployments. And there's other things that, of course, you know, we put a pause button trying too much uncertainty out there. What are you seeing out in the market uh, and how's that impacting uh, you, know, you as a relatively new uh, startup? Yeah. So in general, your point is well taken. The, the cloud players are telling us their demand is up dramatically. And therefore, the signal they're sending us is they want to accelerate deployment and it's likely it's going to be bigger than we had originally had estimated. So that's been great news for us. In the enterprise space, it's really very different. You know, we're not selling a lot of you know, product to Walmart or Gap or, the retail space, they're, they're struggling mightily. The, any hotels, motels, um, Carnival Lines is not buying our product today. But um, if you look at the financials, you look at the pharmas, um, their demand's up quite a bit. They're both buying ahead a little bit to hedge their bets in the supply chain for a situation today. And they're actually seeing their real demand go up. The banks especially have seen it go up because their work from home has gone through the roof. So um, it's, been a, it's been a good opportunity for us to sort of seize the moment and demonstrate how we can be part of their new implementations um, and bring new services to them. Yeah, Randy, wonder if you can actually, you know, give us a little bit that voice of the customer and you know, what is the problem you're solving? Because, you know, we talked about there, there's certain immediate initiatives that companies need to take care of. You know, absolutely like today, security is more important than ever. Um, you know, when, when people are working from home, the bad actors actually are trying even harder uh, to yeah. get involved there. We, we talked a little bit about cloud, so, you know, what is that itch that Pensando scratches and therefore how, how do you fit into the current uh, landscape? Sure, you know, with our customers today, it's, it's, um, there's similar problems and dissimilar problems between the cloud and the enterprise. Um, the similar problems is that Pensando quickly solves things like east-west security inside of their environments, their compute environments, which is difficult to do today. It's expensive and difficult to do today. And we provide it pervasively at wire rate. So that's a sort of an easy sell initially. The other one that's been pretty easy for everyone to look at is observability and telemetry. Because we're, where we're positioned in the compute space, we see every packet, which provides us with a lot of knowledge about what's going on in their environment. So that's been a, a pretty easy initial sell. Um, in, the, in the case of the enterprise customers, you know, we can solve other pieces of their solution that are either expensive or introduce latency or management problems, whether it's firewall technology or load balancing technology or micro segmentation technology all of which we can do inside of our blade. And today is done either through appliances or through virtual machines consuming CPUs. In the cloud space, we do all of that. Plus we allow them to download their own image into our devices today, which is pretty powerful. We've got a, we have a lot of memory and we have a lot of, of capacity from an ARM core perspective. And we allow them to pick and choose the features and functionalities they want and then run everything at wire speeds at much faster speeds. The enterprise is running 10, 25. The, the, Cloud partners are running 2550, going to 100, where we're even more compelling, we think. Um, Randy, I want to get back to talk a little bit more about HPE. Uh, you know, sure. you spent a long time working at Cisco. Uh, for a good part of that, HPE was one of your bigger you know, uh, partners on that. So tell us what it's like working with HPE. Uh, you know, any compare contrast would be uh, welcome. You know, it's interesting. So um, the, the cultural environment of HPE under Antonio Neri is very similar to what we saw at Cisco. And he and John have a phenomenal relationship. It's a very collegial environment. It's a very bright environment. They, they move quickly for a big business. 
Um, where where we're where it's vastly different is they're they're much tougher on the numbers side because they under much more margin pressure and competitive pressures that we ever had at Cisco. It, just in all fairness to them, um, but if we look in, through the organization, like the the executive that was assigned to our account from a sales perspective used to work at Cisco. Um, I think one or two of his guys used to work at Cisco. There's program management people that used to work at Cisco. There are people in engineering that came from Cisco. So it's um it's an environment that's similar enough that it's easy of easy enough for us to navigate, and we're connected sort of on all levels, which has really been useful. And we have a a weekly standing dialogue across all the different functions. So we're pr pretty deeply embedded with HPE right now, and it's gone very very well. Yeah, um, you, you said uh, uh, that uh, you know even with the global pandemic right now, uh, that Pensando is a bit ahead of where you expected shipments to be. I, I'm curious always when I you know, talk to CFO, you know, how do you see you know, macroeconomic uh, impact of what is going on there? Uh, any concerns on your end about you know, supply chain, uh, either for yourselves or for partners like uh, HPE? Uh, you know, how, how do you see uh, you know, what we're currently going through and uh, you know, the recovery yeah. uh, in the future? So it's an interesting question. You know, getting this pandemic sort of processed through the supply chains like a pig through a python. There's just no way to get around it. I mean, you know, we had the first breakdown where they closed the country of Malaysia, and I just couldn't build final product. It, they literally just shut the place down. So it took us a, well, about ten days to get ourselves up and running from a skeleton perspective. The government worked with us to let a small crew come into our uh, manufacturing partner to, to get some finished goods out from one of our OEM customers. Um, as we've come back up, we've seen lead times extend on some of the custom parts. It's just a fact of life. Um, I think there's a there's a, a little bit of an artificial demand that's driving the supply chain a little bit crazy right now because now people are panicked that what happens if it comes back? Will I get caught again? Can I get enough inventory to buffer myself for you know two weeks to three or four months, depending on how aggressive you want to be or conservative you want to be in that space? And then I think as the supply chain trickles back online, you end up discovering that. Yes, I can build final product and I can get the ASICs and the memory, but now I want to buy some, you know, RS-232 devices. And it turns out that, sure, he's got them, but the magnetic that goes inside of it that comes from East, Western China, they aren't quite up and running just yet. So we're seeing legacy problems, nothing catastrophic, nothing that's been painful. Um, we've had to move some work around to get an incremental volume for ourselves. We've, we've added fab vendors and a few other things. So. Um, it's really made us focus on second sourcing everywhere we can um, because we were we thought we were small enough from a volume perspective it wasn't that big a deal. We'll just get to second sourcing once we get the product to market. That's heated back up, and we're doing all that work now. So, um, I think knock on wood, this is our recovery has gone very well. Um, we we don't see any big problems in the supply chain now. I think the bigger the player, like an HPE, and the longer the window they were shut down, the harder they pull when they turn the supply chain back on. So I think the big players, Cisco, HPE, and others, it's going to take them a longer time, I think, to really see how this trickles all the way through, because you can't really get good visibility. How much safety stock or buffer stock does everybody have at every level of the chain? So if everybody pulls at once, do you run dry in a week, a month? Is it fast enough to recover from a production perspective? All those things, I think, are still not quite resolved yet. Yeah, uh, just one other related uh, aspect of, uh, of of the pandemic that I would love your viewpoint on. Uh, you know, work from home uh, obviously is what everyone is doing right now. Uh, I'm curious if you think that you know what the recovery looked like from that standpoint. Is there anything from Pensando that makes you shift where you think about hiring it? You know, I've been to you know the, the Cisco headquarters, and you know it's a long street with a lot of buildings and a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and you know everybody's wondering, you know, will that you know headquarters and centralized uh, structure that we had before, you know, is that forever changed? And that's a great question. So um, it's for certain changed, I think, until there's a therapeutic or a vaccine for the current um, COVID virus. So that's just a fact of life. Um, and we've been comparing notes with a lot of other companies about how, what they're doing to bring the workers back who want it, who are comfortable, want to come back to work. Is it even inside of Pensando? I've got some folks are like, listen, I'm not comfortable coming back. I've got kids at home. I don't want to take the chance. That's fine. We don't have a problem with that. And quite frankly, we can make a case that in some of our functional areas, we're more productive than we were before the pandemic. In India specifically, this has been a boon for us because they're not getting on and off buses. They're not spending three or four hours trying to get back and forth to work. They're happy working from home. Um, we're happy having them at home. The, the guy who runs India for us says productivity is up and employee satisfaction couldn't be higher. 
our plans now is we we have to bring a small team back into our headquarters in um, in Milpitas to bring up our new ASIC. So that's going to be 15 to 20 people, not all at one time. We're going to spread them out. We've, we're already articulating what parts of the building can and can't be used. One-way hallways, masking, temperature taking, everything you would expect. Um, the next phase for us is some sort of rotational work where we'll say, we're going to bring 25% of the people in, 30% of the people in. You work a week, you're off for two. You work a week, you're off for two. Until we can get through the back of this thing, it's unlikely, it's almost impossible in my mind, we would bring back 100% of our employees into the building. Now, does that change the view long-term? It's a great question because um, I think what has forced us to do is to get more comfortable with remote work so that we can truly make it an option of an, if any one employee in specific areas. Like the lab guys have to be in the lab and the IT guys got to be in the computer room. But if you're a software developer, if you're a marketing guy, do you really have to be in the building? And I think it's pushed us to really learn to manage them more effectively with remoteness. And I think it provides us, at least with options going forward, when I hire the next 100, do I have to put them in a building someplace or do I just deal with them where they are and bring them into the fold? We've brought on dozens of people since the pandemic started. And quite honestly, we onboard them, we train them, and we mainstream them remotely. And it's worked out great. Excellent. All right, Randy, uh, let's uh, bring it back to the HPE uh, partnership for, for the final question. <laughs> sure. Tell us what we should be looking at uh, through the rest of this year, uh, what uh, the, the general availability of this you know, means to your business and uh, the impact you expect it to have on your customers. So um, from an HPE perspective, I think this is going to be great innovation they're bringing to the marketplace to their customer set. It allows them to, I think, separate themselves in the market, at least for some period of time. And until the other players um, get pulled along by the end users. Um, it's, the product has a pretty steep ramp. The front half and the back half of the year for us are dramatically different in terms of size and ramp, and it really sets us up for a very large, we hope, um, fiscal 22, which for us will end in January 31st of 22. Um, we, we, we're going to know. I mean, if we go GA in just a few weeks, um, we're going to get a sense so that we, we can turn these pocks into end customers. Um, we're also going to see the ramp of the cloud customers in Q4. So, you know, I really feel like both for us and for HPE, the next three, four months as we start getting back to some regularity of interacting with customers physically, not just um, remotely, um, and we see the early benefits and some of the early um, cost of ownership analysis on deployment of our technology, this could be dramatic for us and for them, quite honestly. All right, well, Randy Pond, CFO of Pensando, thanks so much. Really a pleasure catching up with you and getting to discuss about how Pensando is helping to future-proof your enterprise. Thank you very much, it's my pleasure. Have a great day. All right, I'm Stu Miniman. Check out thecube.net for all our coverage. Thank you for watching theCUBE.